Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Uh, welcome to the third session, the third class uh, on Urban Resilience Masterclass. Today we'll be discussing uh, using making uh, cities resilient 2030 tools for disaster res resilient infrastructure by the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. We have two eminent speakers, one of course the head, Mr. Sanjay Bhatia is the head of the Office of United Nations uh, Office for Disaster Risk Reduction in Incheon, Korea. He has uh, guided over 9,000 government officials uh, globally. Uh, before that, he was working with the International Recovery Platform, the Secretariat at uh, Japan. We also have today Utarika, also known as Mai, who uh, serves as the global coordinator at the Making Cities Resilient campaign. And she manages not only the monitoring of the, and the piloting of the projects and collaborating with various partners at Resident Cities, but she's also the uh, program officer and Getty. Without taking more time, I'm going to hand it over to Sanjaya and to Mai. The only request to all the participants, please do put all your questions in the uh, question and answer box, not at the chat box. And the second is we have a task, we have an assignment after, uh, I mean, you should be starting the assignments from now itself, uh, which is a part of uh, all the four master classes where you have to write a blog, yeah? Uh, it's written on the prevention work web space, but we'll give more information after today's class. Thank you and over to Sanjay. Okay, thank you, uh, Priya, and welcome to all the participants. So let me just share my screen and get into the um, into the master class. I think you can see uh, see the slide now. Uh, so we are going to uh, talk about uh, infrastructure uh, resilience, and we are going to talk about. Uh, the role of local governments in that and and uh, look at a few cases on that and also finally uh, look at a tool which can be used and then uh, later i have a um, we will be administering a little bit of uh, a quiz uh, which all of you can participate in so first let's let's get into the into the details so first, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, a global initiative called the Making Cities Resilient 2030. So now, um, why this is relevant is because this is actually uh, based on 10 years of experience administering a global campaign called the Making Cities Resilient campaign from 2010 to 2020. And that, uh, that campaign had more than 4,360 uh, cities as part of the, uh, as part of the, um, as members of the campaign. And this is, uh, of course, focused on resilience of the cities, but infrastructure resilience is a key part uh, of that. And, and one of the tools that we will talk about is, is uh, from that uh, campaign. So based on that experience, uh, it was felt that there is still a lot of work to be done to increase the resilience of local governments. And when we talk local governments, we mean anything subnational. So it could be, of course, cities, towns. Uh, in some cases, it has also been provinces um, and even districts. So, uh, this is a global campaign started in January 21, just a couple of months ago, and uh, and uh, it going on all the way to December 2030. Now, the the key objectives of this uh, uh, campaign are um, to help cities know better, to understand the risk, to plan better, um, so and uh, to to be able to uh, plan keeping in mind the requests and the, and the criteria from the Sendai framework, the Paris Agreement, and the Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, also to, and most importantly, to implement that. So not just have plans in place, but, uh, but to be able to implement them uh, properly. At the same time, it's also looking at the national and local linkings. So, 
uh, we all know that uh, the local does not exist without the national and the national is the sum of the local. So uh, all of these uh, need to work together uh, and, and to share their resources and their technical expertise and, and guidance and so on. It's also looking at the horizontal links and this is the most important. These are the, the, the partners which exist in the, in the region or the area of the city in the jurisdiction. So it could be, for example, universities, it could be research centers, it could be uh, private sector companies providing technical support, uh, it could be banks, uh, it could be financiers. So all kinds of uh, partners uh, and entities which are available uh, in this uh, local government's uh, area of jurisdiction and which can support uh, even from outside that area of jurisdiction. So who can support the cities in achieving more sustainable development. And then uh, and, uh, importantly also linking cities with other cities so that they can talk about their experiences and share uh, their knowledge and, and what they have learned. So in a nutshell, this is what the MCR 2030 looks like. Uh, it's um, um, three stages of cities, uh, three stages in the, on, along what we call the resilience roadmap, uh, stage A, stage B, stage C. Of course, cities can join at any stage. It depends on what is their level of uh, resilience. Uh, they can, um, so for example, in stage A, there are cities mostly which are new to the concept. They are trying to understand the concept of resilience. Stage B, it is the cities which are more um, understanding. They are able to use diagnostic tools to understand how resilient they are. Uh, and then uh, looking at uh, listing out actions that they need to take to, to make themselves more resilient. And uh, lastly, we have the stage C cities, which are the ones which are looking at implementing these actions. So stage C is where, where all this, um, for example, the private sectors uh, partners that I talked about, they come in. So if you see in the green area, these are, these are some of the areas of priority for action, which have been identified by cities themselves. So all of this, what you see the Making Cities Resilient 2030 is based on 10 years, one whole decade of work, 20, 2010 to 2020, and almost two years of consultation with cities. And then they came up with this, the green area you can see, this is not set in stone, it is quite uh, flexible and fluid, uh, but here you see ensuring resilient infrastructure. So this is something which cities, um, hundreds of cities around the world have prioritized as something that uh, they need to work on in the future. So again, very uh, important that the International Conference for uh, Disaster Resilient uh, Infrastructure is happening at, the, uh, at this time because it, it's, it's the right time. As, uh, not only because cities have prioritized, but as you know, they have uh, following the, the, the COVID uh, situation there has uh, there have been many stimulus packages insured by government. So um, uh, so for example, in the USA they're planning a two point uh, more than two trillion dollar uh, package uh, focusing only on infrastructure. So there is uh, and there are a lot of stimulus packages uh, in the European Union and others also and. Uh, these are also a large component of these packages is resilient infrastructure. So um, uh, it's either creation of new infrastructure or uh, maintenance and upgradation of the existing infrastructure. So, so the, the CDRI is placed at, the, at, at a very opportune time, actually, if you see that. So there are some key partners. Uh, you see the the logos here, and these are all the all the big players in urban risk reduction and urban resilience. Uh, so they they were the ones who worked with us to develop uh, the concept 
of the MCR 2030, and also they are helping us in the delivery. Apart from that, there is space in this for NGOs, for civil society organizations, uh, universities, um, private sector companies, and so on uh, to join uh, as service providers. Uh, and as you can see, it includes updating of building codes, uh, improving land use planning, uh, developing climate change scenarios at the city level, uh, bond issuance, uh, city ranking indices, and so on. And um, uh, there is a, a, a directory, a registry available in, in, in uh, online, which we call the dashboard, and we'll talk about that in a while. So, so this is uh, how you um, uh, get into the MCR 2030. This is the, um, the website, uh, mcr2030.undrr.org. And here, both cities and uh, partners, uh, entities which want to support the cities, including consultants uh, and, and including those uh, who need to ch uh, charge fees for their services can join. Um, the, the operations are uh, divided into five regions. So each continent is covered uh, and the dashboard uh, and the registry is also available um, in kind of in, in different languages. Uh, so language should not become a barrier. Now, what we want to try to do, we want to ensure that cities are able to be more resilient. Uh, they are able to invest in, in the infrastructure uh, and ensure that they don't lose this investment due to a cyclone or a hurricane or an earthquake or a landslide. So just a few cases uh, on resilient infrastructure, just to, just to get an idea. Uh, now, one, one challenge has always been building codes and taking this building code down to the, to the level of the community. And uh, even in the workspace, I saw there was some discussion on that, uh, that the, the, how important the community is. Uh, so the last mile linkage, and one of the challenges is that, uh, especially in, in developing countries, uh, ensuring that the building code is applied and uh, all the investments in infrastructure, especially the smaller infrastructure like schools uh, or village infrastructure or individual houses or warehouses or shops, they apply the building code. So in some countries, what they have done is, um, they have tried to convert or translate this technical information in the, in the building code into easy to understand pictorial messages. So, so we see uh, some examples here where they have, have drawings, they even have pictures, they have uh, showing you know, good construction practice and also with a red cross showing a bad construction practice. So, so those are uh, good for, um, uh, especially for users who, who may not be, they don't, they don't have to be an engineering graduate to understand the building code. So they, they can look at it and understand, yes, this makes sense. Uh, because um, as we talk about resilience also, we must remember uh, a large part of resilience is common sense. It's not, uh, it's not just about uh, engineering or architecture or um, science. It, it's a lot of it is common sense. So this has been quite successful. There are many, many more examples. I've just shown a couple. Uh, another uh, interesting way is to use the um, a stress test. So uh, this is a kind of, you know, when, when there is no, emergency at that time to do a tabletop exercise. It could be for a hospital, for example, to see what is the mass casualty scenario. So as you know, I mean, if somebody had done a stress test in 2019 of the hospitals around the world, uh, it would have been very interesting to see uh, the situation that we have now that just yesterday, France has declared a lockdown because their hospitals are overwhelmed. So 
um, so doing this kind of stress test for the critical infrastructure uh, when you have the time uh, is a good idea because then you find out the weaknesses and then you can address that. Uh, and this is exactly what we don't want. This is a scene from Kobe uh, in, the, in the Kobe earthquake. And these are the transportation network, uh, which, which collapsed and it took two years to, to reconstruct. So this is what we don't want uh, to happen. Now going into the, uh, the toolkit. So, I gave you an assignment. I hope you did that uh, in the in the workspace to to have a look at the uh, scorecard. So this is the scorecard, uh, and and we we shared a copy of the scorecard with you on the workspace also, and focus on section eight, what we call essential eight, which is on infrastructure, and thinking of the of the town uh, or or city where you live. As an example, see how you would answer those questions. Uh, and do you think that those indicators help you to better understand all the facets of infrastructure resilience? Because often when we talk about infrastructure resilience, we don't think through beginning to end the entire spectrum. So the scorecard was designed to help that thinking to happen. So there are two levels of the scorecard. There is a preliminary and there is a detailed. Uh, the preliminary has 47 criteria or indicators. Uh, the one I shared with you was the preliminary uh, and uh, 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 scoring is between zero to three and the detailed one is scoring between zero to five, but we can have a look at the, the uh, detailed one here. And this is what it typically looks like. So uh, there is a question or a, or a criteria, and then there is a response. So zero is of course zero, uh, nothing is done, and five is, is the best scenario. Um, there is, uh, so the response has to be done first. There are means of verification, so explaining why. So suppose somebody, uh, suppose a city ranks uh, as three, so why, why you have ranked as three? Why not four, why not two? Uh, what are the supporting documents? Why this is important is also because people change with time the, 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 the position, the person in that position changes. So, um, so it's important. So for example, if somebody looks at the scorecard result after, let's say, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> after three years, um, uh, you know, there won't, there may not be the memory why, why it was rated three. So the explanation is very important and the supporting documents. Um, then uh, another important point is is the stage stage three is the actions. So so suppose we find that we are uh, you know in, st in in we rate ourselves three for this criteria then. Um, what are the steps that we could take to move from three to four and then maybe later from four to five? So what are those actions which we need to take? So for example, suppose, uh, and one of the questions is about uh, a building code, uh, has it been updated? And suppose in our city, there is a building code, it's, um, it's dated, um, 2001 and now it's been 20 years needs to be updated so <clears throat> so we rate ourselves as two or three and we do have a building code but it needs to be updated so what are the actions that you would take to update it maybe you would establish a, a, a network of universities uh, civil engineers um, architects uh, and, and create a committee and let them uh, look at the existing building code, look at the, the development since then and see uh, and get some urban planners also on board to see what has changed in the city over, over the last 20, 25 years. Uh, and, uh, and then have some recommendations and these recommendations with the language, the text of the edit would go to the, the, the council and then the council will approve. So these are all different steps that you could take uh, in that. So all those actions need to be listed 
uh, and then of course, who, who will do it, who will be the lead, who will be the supporting institutes, uh, and what is the time scale for that. So it could be uh, for an exercise like this, it could be two or three years, uh, but yeah. So, uh, so that is what the scorecard does. It helps you to firstly to uh, understand where you are. It helps you to visualize where you want to be and what are the steps that you need to take to, to reach there. Uh, and, and then it helps you to develop a kind of a plan. So you have, you have the steps, you have the who is responsible, you have the time scale. So you are halfway to a bankable project actually because when you've done this exercise. Of course, uh, it is subjective. Uh, so normally it's done in a workshop mode with all the, 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 the key city departments should be present, all the key city officials should be present and uh, uh, they go through the scorecard, then they go back, they spend some time uh, doing some research and putting in and then come back and determine the, the scale and then they justify uh, why the score is two or three or five. Um, and uh, and and maybe moderate uh, the the scoring uh, so that it is as accurate as possible because the idea is is of course not to find fault the idea is to improve now <clears throat> uh, the scorecard is divided into ten essentials so these are ten essentials that the uh, that a city needs to uh, adopt. Uh, and um, it uh, the essential eight is for for infrastructure, uh, and it it covers uh, all these kinds of areas: so water, energy, uh, electricity, gas, uh, and and it looks at uh, firstly it look it looks at the disruption of services, so customer days at risk of loss. So, so for example, if there is a hurricane or a cyclone how many days or how many hours the electricity is cut off. Uh, similarly, for water uh, or others, um, then uh, are trying to understand the cascading impact of that. So if electricity is cut off, what is, go what is going to happen to the traffic? Because those <clears throat> traffic lights are going to be off. What is going to happen to the health sector? Because the hospitals will not have electricity. So what's going to happen to that? So looking at the cascading impacts, looking at the cost of restoration and looking at the um, regular maintenance and also it covers transportation also communications so transportation of course very important which includes roads and includes like um, subway systems metro systems uh, if the city has an airport if the city has a port all of this or a ferry a jetty whatever it covers communications, which include the um, uh, mobile services, which is very, very important. Healthcare and education, prisons, because again, uh, that is a, it is a critical infrastructure. And you need to, as you have seen, even in the COVID situation, some uh, prisons uh, became a kind of a hotspot in some countries for clusters. So uh, where you have a lot of people in cramped conditions with less ventilation, how do you manage? The administrative operations, meaning the, uh, the, the government, the government offices, uh, these are also important. And then the data and the computer systems, are they backed up, uh, health records, the schooling records, the tax records, are, are there backups for this or are they lost? Um, for example, in many cities in Japan during the tsunami, um, they lost all their tax records because uh, they had backup in the same building. They, so they had the tax office, they had the tax records, they had it backed up in another part of the building. But, uh, but the entire building was flooded. So all the backup was also lost. So again, uh, important to think of. So key factors, uh, a loss of service. Uh, I mean, uh, I could give again the example of the Japan tsunami, um, Fukushima, what happened there? Uh, the whole problem with the nuclear reactor happened because the electricity got knocked out by this tsunami. And 
Fukushima plant had three backups for power. Uh, so, um, and, the, uh, and the last uh, backup was the batteries. Uh, the second backup was the um, diesel generators. Uh, and the first was, of course, the power supply. So the power supply got knocked out. The batteries and the diesel generators were all in the basement and they were flooded. So there was nothing. So, so that just goes to show how, that's why I say common sense, because uh, it, is, it is very possible to have a good backup system. Uh, and there was a discussion in the workspace also about redundancy. So redundancy is important for uh, resilience, uh, but it has to be used with common sense. So the whole Fukushima disaster, which is continuing till date, uh, it is still not in control. Um, happened because the redundancy was kept in the basement in an area which is prone to earthquakes and floods, uh, as earthquakes and tsunamis, and the water immediately flooded the basement. So when the electricity was cut off, there was absolutely no backup. And gradually the reactor, uh, so there was no pumping of water to cool down the reactor. The reactor overheated and it blew. So, um, so that's also a cascading, what we call a cascading emergency. The, the earthquake caused the tsunami, the tsunami caused the power blackout, the power blackout caused the nuclear disaster. But it also looks at uh, return on investment. It looks at fracturing of pipes uh, for water supply, for gas. Uh, in Kobe earthquake, for example, most of the deaths were from um, gas pipeline bursts and in and, and, and wooden uh, structures. So that caused a lot of the fires. Damages to roads and bridges, we saw that photograph with the, with the collapsed <clears throat> uh, bridges. But there's also a, a, a good point from that. From Kobe, uh, what the government did was try to understand why those uh, transportation, um, those elevated highways collapsed. Uh, and then they were uh, able to understand that it was the pillars, they had some weakness. And uh, so what they did was they uh, used that science and the engineering to strengthen pillars all across Japan. So when the uh, tsunami, uh, when the earthquake, Richter 9 earthquake, Kobe was 7.8. This was Richter 9 earthquake happened. None of the uh, transportation uh, network, these elevated highways and even the railways, nothing collapsed uh, during that. So there was a tsunami, there was the earthquake, there was a tsunami, nothing collapsed. And as a result, uh, that helped a lot because um, uh, transportation networks were working. But also in those uh, smaller uh, towns where the tsunami alert happened, there were traffic gridlocks. People were trying to get out and they all converged and, and they got stuck. And there are a lot of videos where you see people are sitting in the car and the wave is coming and they just can't move because they're all stuck. So, <clears throat> so that's also uh, something to think about. Uh, uh, railway losses again, um, uh, rail, railway, uh, so road bridges and railways because railways are directly impacted by electricity. So if the electricity is out, the railways come to a halt uh, in many, uh, especially the metro systems. Communication infrastructure, healthcare and its data, education, prisons and so on. So all of this is covered in the scorecard. So this is what I was mentioning, the entire spectrum of, of uh, infrastructure. And then if you look at uh, the, the results, it has very good analytics. It, uh, uh, you, you feed in the data. And I would encourage you to, to, down, to take the copy from the workspace and just play around with it uh, and, uh, and get a score and see. Uh, and then you'll get this kind of spider web um, analytics. Um, and you can have a look. So for example, uh, this is just an example. Uh, this city scored 355 out of 590. So you see the web diagram and, and you can make out what how the city is doing. So for example, in infrastructure, they're not bad. 
so the gray is the is the part is the maximum that they could have had uh, and they are in the purple so not too bad uh, but they are very bad in essential 10, which is the recovery, for example. So they don't have many plans for recovery. They are bad in essential 2, in 3, in 4, um, in 5, they're not doing well. In 7, they're not doing well. Uh, <clears throat> 8 and 9, they're not so bad. So, so this helps to, uh, to visualize which are the weak areas and then which are the areas which need to be uh, focused on for or prioritized uh, for improvement. So, so if the city had a choice, probably they'd focus on okay, let's let's focus uh, our budget on uh, essential ten, essential seven, maybe essential three. Uh, let's prioritize these three for the next two years or three years, and ensure that. Um, we increase our scoring here and then revisit the scorecard after let's say three years uh, and, and see if there is any improvement. And revisit also because the demography or the risk factors in the city might change. So for example, in a, in a city, uh, the population of course increases, that changes um, the risk profile of the city. Also, there might be a new uh, a new port developed in the city or a new petrochemical factory uh, in the vicinity of the city that changes the risk profile again. So <clears throat> this is again hypothetical example looking at uh, uh, the essential eight, which is the infrastructure resilience. And here again, so then then you can go into more depth. So this is overall, uh, and here we saw that eight is is not so bad. But here you look into more depth into eight, and you see that uh, uh, eight point five point seven, which is trans cost of restoration of services of transport routes, is is weak. Um, so that needs improvement. Eight point four point three, which is uh, uh, gas supply failures, is again weak. So that needs that's an area where which needs improvement. And you can see, so using, so the whole idea is of the scorecard to help to focus and to prioritize where the investment should be made. But there are other benefits also. So uh, of course it gives a baseline. So your city does uh, a scorecard today, then they can revisit after, let's say, um, after three years or two years and, and, and keep, seeing their progressive uh, uh, progression. Uh, it in increases awareness because like I said, so just looking at infrastructure, it talks about the entire spectrum and uh, uh, it goes into that kind of detail in all the sectors. It en enables uh, dialogue. Uh, so often in the, in the government, in the city government and even in the national government, different departments don't speak to each other much. So this helps to create that space in the workshop where everyone meets each other, they talk with each other, there are informal relationships developed, which also help in moments of crisis. Um, it helps to prioritize the investment and action, which we already discussed, uh, helps to develop a kind of a strategy for resilience and leads to the actions that need to be taken. So with that, I'll end and hand over. Um, so um, I do see a couple of questions. Let me just quickly address that. Uh, why only in cities, no, uh, why, why does rural area not require resilience? No, not at all. The rural area does, does require resilience. And that's why the example that I'm showing about the, the building code and trying to translate uh, the technical aspects of the building code to more visual and pictorial uh, so that people can understand. That's why it is very, very important. In fact, that's where it has been used the most in rural areas. So, so yeah, uh, it, it, it's, it's important both ways. Uh, there has been a little bit more focus recently on the urban areas. One of the reasons is that by 2050, it is estimated that 70% of the world's population will be living in urban areas. 
and that's because there are more job opportunities there are better services uh, in the urban areas but there are also many problems because of that more more, more people moving into the urban areas means there is a lot of unplanned development and so on so so that um, but but that is why there has been slightly more more focus on the urban areas because more and more population is moving even in the covid you see uh, the uh, the urban was the the areas which were most devastated by the covid uh, yeah and then um, which cities are using this framework to plan resilience locally so so there are uh, more than 230 40 cities around the world which have used this there are other frameworks also uh, by UN Habitat, by World Bank, and others. This was this is the the kind of the most easy to use. It is available in about eighteen languages or even more, um, and uh, uh, so so it it's it's quite good. Uh, so before uh, what I'll do is I'll answer some of the other questions by typing. But in in interest of time, now we'll administer the quiz. So you'll have some, uh, let's see, uh, about five, uh, five to 10 minutes to do the quiz and then we'll discuss the answers. So I hand over to Priya for the quiz. Priya and Mai. Thanks, Sandhya. So yeah, we'll uh, start the quiz right now. You'll see the Sandhya, question. Maybe, maybe before we administer the quiz, I just want to show briefly um, the scorecard file just like just to get the glimpse of how the tool works so that it will maybe aiding um some understanding a little bit of what you are saying so allow me to hijack the screen sharing um here we go here we go i hope you can see my screen yes yeah. So this is a scorecard. Um, I, I take out the preliminary version, which is um, lighter and easier um, to, to administer. So here in the scorecard, so one, once you open the Excel file, there are 10 circles down here that depicts different type, um, different essential. So circle one is essential one. These are the questions talking about the organization of, um, for resilience, about plan, coordination, and stuff like that. And if we jump right to the eighth one, the eighth essential. This is where the infrastructure um, is the main focus. And you can see these are the type of questions that we included in the in in the scorecard. So let's take 8.2 as an example. The question asked simply for the city to self um, reflect is existing protective infrastructure well designed and well built based on the risk information. And the city would be able to um, well the official would be able to discuss and and decide whether you know from zero that no the city is really is not protected from 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 any hazard or risk until um the score three where all of the infrastructure in this case protective infrastructure meaning levees um shelters the drainage and, and the stuff that you built to to protect the city with and and if all of this infrastructure has been well designed, built according to the, the, the regulations and based on the risk information, meaning that your city is very, very well protected. But if you score somewhere in between, then um, there are rooms of improvement. And of course, when you are doing this um, in a city setting, you'll get different opinions from different officials. So you may have different interpretation of the answer. And this is where you can use that as an opportunity, opportunity to discuss among yourself um, and share information and derive with the, the, the common understanding. And yeah, and, and, and this will be something that if you have a chance, please take a look. And I saw also in the chat that um, there are some uh, dead link to download the scorecard. So, so let me take a look at that and maybe we'll, we'll fix it very soon and we'll, we'll update to you when the, the link will become operational so that you can download the file once again. Yes, so just that. So. And uh, I had shared the link of the scorecard with all of you in the workspace already. Yeah, that so link is the there. Work. So that, that, <laughs> uh, that, that, no, but it, no, no, the scorecard is on the workspace. 
Okay, so it's just the link. The scorecard yeah. is on the workspace, so please download it from the workspace. Uh, and that was the pre-assignment actually to to read the section eight of the scorecard. Yeah. So now, uh, Priya, can you ad administer the, the the quiz? So it, there are ten questions. Uh, uh, look at them, and then we'll discuss the answers in about five six minutes or so. We'll see. Yeah, we're starting the quiz right now. Yes. So there are all together ten. 10 questions. Each of the questions you can answer true or false. It's pretty straightforward and simple. So please take your time to read through and select your um, answer and we'll come to discuss the answer later on. Can 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 you tell us how many percents have completed the poll? Yes, we have three minutes more. We're going to take a five minutes uh, aspect, so we have two minutes more to complete the poll. So about 47, um, 43 of the participants have completed the poll. We have 70 people in the room. So. Yes, and we just going to take one more minute. Just one more. We'll take a few more. And if you have questions, keep throw them in the Q&A. We started to see more questions and we'll come to attend it very soon. Okay, I think we can close the polls now. Yes. So can and you show the result? Uh, yes. Can you show it answer by answer or total? Even if it's total, we'll manage. Okay, total, okay. Okay, so uh, so that the last 15 minutes we'll, we'll do this. Um, uh, so, uh, Disasters um, are, a, are a natural phenomena and the impacts are beyond human control. So this is false um, because uh, a lot of what happens in, in the exposure to risk is based on our behavior. So for example, if we build a school uh, on a floodplain or right next to a river, 
or even if we build, uh, like you see in many uh, cities, uh, prime real estate based, uh, built on the seacoast or on the riverside, well, that area is prone to floods. Uh, and, uh, and, and so if we built over there, then we, we should expect the floods to damage that infrastructure. Uh, and uh, so we can't blame it all on nature. It is it is a lot on the uh, based on the our behavior, uh, and it is definitely in human control. So it's all issues of land use planning, of building code, uh, and uh, and uh, common sense. Uh, then the next one was maintenance of infrastructure is not an issue of resilience, so that's correct. Uh, most of you got it right, uh, that, that is a false statement because maintenance is a very important issue. And if you actually see um, all, uh, all this stimulus money that is coming uh, in the post COVID, there is a very good case to use that for maintenance rather for, than for building new infrastructure. Um, there, is a, there are many reports uh, with banks that maintenance creates more jobs than, uh, than uh, new infrastructure building. So, so uh, uh, maintenance will create more jobs and also of course it will help to protect uh, the infrastructure from future damage. And the third question is uh, the scorecard can help to understand the status of, so everyone got it right, 100%, very good. So I think people have done the homework Excellent. Um, yes, it can help to understand the, the gaps uh, and then uh, we work on those gaps and to prioritize. Uh, number four is loss of service data is not required to understand the level of resilience, which is false. Uh, and, the, and the reason is that uh, the example, like uh, I said, mentioned about if, if there is electricity cut uh, that will impact the traffic lights, which will cause traffic congestion. It can impact the health system. It can impact, we saw the example of Fukushima also. It was basically a problem of electricity supply. So loss of service uh, data is very much imp important for gas, for water, for electricity, transportation and others, so that we know um, how much service is lost. Then the fifth one is uh, in the scorecard, infrastructure uh, includes agriculture. That is false. Uh, the scorecard does not uh, cover uh, agriculture as part of infrastructure. It's mostly focusing on um, urban, uh, urban areas. So, so agriculture is not, uh, though, though food supply and all is. So then, the sixth one, data you will need to complete the scorecard includes health data. So most of you got it right, yes. Uh, so not only health data, but also education data, you need data on the prison systems, you need data, the government data, you need all kinds of data. Um, and, uh, and that's why it's important to have the multi-sectoral workshop approach. There are parts of the scorecard which you can give to different sections of the government. But if you have the, uh, a few workshops also, so they take the part that is relevant to them, they work on it, they, decide, they look at uh, what should be the score, but then uh, there should be a number of interactions in the workshop so that uh, um, you can uh, make sure that the data is being used, but also sometimes the data is with somebody else. So for example, health data, in some countries, there are public hospitals and there are private hospitals. In some countries, there are only private hospitals. So, uh, so then how, do you, how does the city get that kind of data uh, is also, you know, how many patients are there and if the electricity is cut, what kind of backup do the hospitals have? Um, it will vary from hospital to hospital. Uh, so, so getting all that data, sometimes you have to go to the private sector also. And uh, in many countries, utilities are in the private sector. So again, you have to involve the private sector utilities in the discussion, in the workshop for the scorecard. Then um, 
Then we looked at uh, the only department concerned with reduction of risk is the emergency managed department. And then again, most of you, uh, all of you almost got it correct, which is, which is true, it is false. So resilience or reduction of risks, all of this is, is, is the work of uh, all, um, it's, it's the work of everyone. And in the workspace also, some of you discussed about the community, it's that also. So it's not just the, the government departments, uh, the city departments sitting together, but it's also uh, involving the community. There are community-based um, disaster risk management tools. Um, there are uh, tools to help ward level planning. There are tools to help village level planning. So all kinds of tools are available. So it is everyone's uh, business. Yes, and there was also a question that came in asking whether the scorecard and the res resilience considered de decentralization and and diversity and in, um, engagement of different stakeholders. And yes, we're, we're right on that as well. Yeah. And then the scorecard considers the resilience of computer systems as an issue. Yes, it does. Uh, and that's true. Uh, because uh, like the example I gave in the city uh, in, in um, Japan, which uh, lost all its tax data uh, and they had a backup. So they knew that they have to keep a backup. So they kept a backup, but it was in the same building. The entire building was covered by the tsunami. The entire three-story building, the tsunami uh, waves gradually built up, the water went right into all the floors. So, um, uh, so they lost all the data. So yes, backup is very, very important. And nowadays, of course, there's a possibility of backup on the cloud. So, so that helps a lot. Doesn't have to be a physical backup. Um, then uh, question nine was uh, uh, traffic uh, gridlock is not an issue of resilience. Uh, yeah, that's false uh, because um, in uh, in many disasters, you see that um, th there are many issues about traffic gridlock. One is, of course, that people need to get out. If, if there is, for example, a tsunami or something like that, there's an alert, then people need to be able to get out. And if they get stuck in a traffic jam, then they're uh, very vulnerable. Uh, but also, uh, if there is traffic gridlock, uh, even after a disaster, so like the uh, transportation, infrastructure is damaged, then the relief material, the search and rescue teams cannot get in. So that also becomes um, challenging. And um, that's why some countries, what they are doing is they are designating certain roads and streets as, as uh, uh, critical, uh, infrastructure, uh, critical, in, uh, critical roads. Uh, and they, these they build to higher levels of um, engineering, even higher than the, what the building code requires. So, and, and the whole reason is that these will be the exit and the entry point, uh, or in the city, for example, it could be roads leading to the main hospital of the city, things like that. So they, they, they are often uh, 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 this thing, uh, critical. Uh, designated critical. And then the last one was communication is the most critical infrastructure. That's true. Um, because without that, neither your search and risk, firstly, your early warning will not work. Um, and then the updates, uh, alerts will not work. The search and rescue will not work. Um, the response will fail. The relief measures will fail. Everything will fail. So redundancy and this was a discussion in the in the workspace also about the redundancy so uh, out of all the aspects of infrastructure resilience probably communication redundancy is most important and i gave one example in the workspace in of fiji where the uh, mobile uh, services provider is digicel and what they did was uh, you know, Fiji uh, is prone to earthquakes, tsunami, landslides, floods, uh, <clears throat> hurricanes, cyclones. So you name it, they have it. 
uh, and uh, and and they realize that uh, they realized uh, Digicel, the service provider, which is a private provider, uh, realized that uh, uh, resilience of the inf communication infrastructure is very important. So what they did was, um, wherever they built the tower, they did a risk assessment and uh, multi-hazard risk assessment. So. <clears throat> All the towers that they have built, they are resilient to earthquake, they are resilient to landslide, flooding, uh, cyclone, uh, so all of these. And as a result, uh, what has happened is that over the years, they, they are known for their resilience and they provide the mobile services. And these mobile services are never um, uh, disconnected because or disrupted uh, because of the disaster. So, so yes, communication is the most important. So with this, uh, we come to an end uh, yeah. of the quiz. Yeah, there, there. yeah, there are a few questions left in the Q and A. Um, there was one question to to explain a little bit. Um, explain again about the agricultural question. I think question number five in the scorecard okay. includes agriculture. Can you repeat that again, please? So the the scorecard does not uh, include agriculture uh, as part of infrastructure because it's focusing more on the urban um urban facilities and services uh, and agriculture is not one of those but it does look at supply chains for example and um, so we all saw for example <clears throat> even what happened in the Suez Canal just a few days ago for a week the Suez Canal was blocked and there were 500 ships on both sides stuck so that's going to have a ripple effect uh, the supplies uh, it's going to impact supplies between the uh, west and the east, uh, uh, which we will feel maybe in a couple of months, uh, but it, it will come. So it, it does look at supply chains and so on. It looks at um, uh, food supply and all, but but not as at agriculture because basically focusing on urban services. Yes, and um, maybe if we can take maybe a, one or two more questions very briefly. Um, there is a question that, the, well, if, if you are not working with the city government, is there a possibility that the person can work and support planning ministry in the country as an external consultant to administer the use of a scorecard and assess the resilience of infrastructure to reduce the future risk impact? This is a very good point. And uh, uh, that's why we are uh, uh, looking at even in the, in the um, MCR 2030 at vertical linkage between the national and the local. Um, and there have been countries where the national government has picked up a urban resilience, national urban resilience program. And there, there is then great opportunity for um, uh, consultancies, uh, academia and others to support the national government in rollout of, of this kind of program. But uh, that would be the ideal situation if the national governments pick it up. And that's what we are trying through the MCR 2030 to reach out to not only the cities directly, but also through the national governments. There is also an example that we have had also that um, the university take the lead in doing the scorecard assessment by convening and inviting the government officials and different stakeholders and kind of doing the pilot of the, the scorecard assessment as a group and later on um, partner with the government to take it forward. That could also be another possibility. And maybe one last question. Um, there was a suggestion that some of the questions in the scorecard is very specific. specific. For example, um, in question, one of the questions mentioned about um, preparing the healthcare capability within 36 hours in the most severe case. And because of the example of COVID that we have not the rapid um, type of the, the disaster strike. So the, the period of the time maybe could be, or the wording could actually be revised to cover a, a wider breadth of, of scenarios. So in this also, I mean, it is quite uh, uh, flexible in the sense that if you want to, um, you know, answer it a bit differently, you can put it in the comments box. Uh, for example, and uh, instead of saying that the, uh, the most critical cases are treated within 36 hours, it could be that most critical cases are admitted within as soon as possible or within 36 hours or within 24 hours, because even that has become a challenge. 
the reason why france has gone into sudden lockdown is is one of the one of the reasons is that they don't have hospital beds available so the doctors uh, told the government that they would now have to start doing what is known as triage meaning that when pa uh, covid patients are lined up outside the hospital they will look at uh, and and try to take a decision who is that person who if treated firstly if admitted and then treated has more chance of survival than the others and those will be admitted and the others will have to be not not receiving the medical aid so that's that's a very dire situation uh, where uh, doctors have to use triage uh, and and that's why uh, france uh, president french president decided to go for the lockdown uh, to avoid such a situation yes so I think we will take that as a last question and um, maybe in my Priya. Type out the others. Yeah, yeah and, and there's just one, one note that I want to drop to everyone. Um, the MCR campaign website seemed to be down. That's why you cannot access the, the download of the scorecard. So our IT team will be checking and we'll try to put it back up very soon. So please check back and, and um, download the scorecard later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sajaya and Mike. Thank you for um, covering everything so well in such a short period of time. Thank you for going through uh, the MCR as a whole and specifically on the scorecard. I also want to thank you specifically for, uh, for stressing on the fact of uh, how infrastructure has a cascading impact on uh, everything and that we cannot plan for cities really in isolation, infrastructure cannot be planned in isolation. We have to, uh, cities have to adopt a systems approach and how they uh, how they look at infrastructure only so that it, at least we can start looking at resilience to begin with. Uh, for, I will keep posting on the uh, prevention web workspace on uh, the next steps, especially everyone <laughs> uh, that we need to start looking at the, uh, the task. Everybody needs to write a, a blog. Of course, there are students who cannot uh, participate live, but they can actually check all, all the pre-recorded sessions and then attend the, the task assigned. And also to say for the next time, the class will not be 60 minutes. It's going to be a 75 minutes class, just to give you a heads up. And uh, thank you once again, Sanjaya, Mai, and all the participants who have been there throughout this whole session. So thank you, everyone. Hope to see you next Thursday, 15th April. Yeah, not next Thank Thursday, you. Thursday after, after next. Yeah, bye. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye bye.